Welcome to our first NOSM COVID-19 weekly clinical rounds. I'm Dr. James Gertson, a family physician and assistant dean of continuing professional development at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Our focus with COVID-19 clinical rounds is to provide you with current and relevant information for managing COVID-19 in Northern Ontario. Our COVID-19 round site is where you will find information on future sessions, clinical resources, and links to our archived presentations. The content for future COVID-19 is, be is being developed on the fly. Please forward your questions and suggested topics using the submit button question at the bottom of the rounds homepage. A few housekeeping uh, announcements for you. If you're joining by WebEx, please use your computer audio as our telephone lines in Northern Ontario are being disrupted by call volumes. If you're joining by telephone, please mute your phone to reduce the audio feedback. We'll be forced to remove you from rounds if you are unmuted and the background noise is disruptive to other attendees. Please send your questions throughout the presentation via the chat feature in WebEx. Questions will be relayed to our presenters by the moderator. And if you are calling into rounds using your telephone, please send questions to the CEPD at nosm.ca uh, website, sorry, email address. Our planning committee has developed these rounds in response to the current need for COVID-19 relevant education for healthcare professionals in Northern Ontario. Uh, no sponsorship has been pursued. And as our knowledge of COVID-19 is rapidly changing, presenters will discuss the be best available information currently available. Let me introduce to you Dr. George, George Passat. George is Director of the NOSM Public Health and Preventive Medical Residency. George has assembled our team of presenters and will moderate our questions today. Thank you very much, Dr. Gertsen, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is a real pleasure for um, the Public Health and Preventive Medicine Residency Program at NOSM to uh, participate in partnership with the Continuing Education and Professional Development Program to offer um, this first uh, or inaugural uh, rounds in this series. Uh, we hope to be back to do more, and I'll have more about that at the end of uh, uh, this uh, session. Um, we um, um, are privileged today to have uh, several uh, um, infection prevention and control experts joining us. Um, um, speaking today will be Dr. Maureen Sibidino, who completed her MD in family medicine residency at McMaster, holds a diploma in occupational health and safety and certification with the Canadian Board of Occupational Medicine and certification in infection prevention control and epidemiology. She uh, works as an IPAC physician at Public Health Ontario and is a member of the PIDAC Infection Prevention and Control uh, Committee. She was also the co-chair of the OHA OMA Communicable Disease Surveillance Protocol Committee and is a member of the PHAC National Advisory Committee on Infection Prevention and Control. She continues to work as an occupational health physician at, in academic and community uh, acute care hospitals. Vicki Willett is the registered nurse with over 15 years of experience in infection prevention and control uh, and with certification in infection control. Before joining Public Health Ontario, she was the an infection control professional at a large community hospital in northeastern Ontario and she's currently the team lead for the regional IPAC team in the north which she will speak of uh, later. In 2014, she worked with the World Health Organization uh, on the Ebola response in Sierra Leone as an IPAC consultant, and with uh, more recently with Doctors Without Borders as an IPAC manager for the development of a new rural hospital, uh, new pediatric hospital in rural, rural Sierra Leone. Um, subsequently, she worked with the WHO Global IPAC unit in Geneva. And Lori Schatzler is a regional infection prevention and control specialist, also with the regional IPAC support team in the north. 
Um, prior to starting with PHO, she worked as a registered nurse for a family health team in Northeastern Ontario, as well as being instrumental in leading their IPAC and occupational health and safety programs. She's worked as an occupational health nurse in acute care, as a public health nurse, uh, and in, uh, in both Northeastern Ontario and in Michigan. And she maintains her certifications in infection control and occupational health nursing and brings those areas of expertise to today's uh, discussion. So I'm very pleased that we were able to recruit uh, such a team of experts to speak to infection prevention and control issues in uh, predominantly northern primary care. The outline of today's presentation is that Dr. Sividino will speak to pr provide an overview of the situation and key IPAC principles and speak to specimen management in primary care. Uh, Lori will speak to passive and active screening in the context of COVID-19 and uh, recommendations for the use of personal protective equipment. And finally, we've received questions related to environmental cleaning and those will be addressed by Vicki uh, Willett. Before turning over the microphone to them, I just wanted to try to set the context for the issues we are going to be discussing. This is the Johns Hopkins dashboard that many of you uh, will have seen. And uh, this is a snapshot from this morning, which illustrates that there are over 200,000 total confirmed cases and uh, over 10,000 deaths. And whereas the red dots in the map in originally started uh, in China and then around China, uh, clearly they have spread across the world and uh, obviously are influencing control strategies on a worldwide basis. Um, it's uh, remarkable to think that in the context of um, the number of confirmed cases that have occurred, it took approximately two to three months to register the first 100,000 confirmed cases and only 12 days to experience the next 100,000 confirmed cases, indicating the degree to which um, this is expanding uh, around the world uh, and, obvious, and obvious from the map that we just saw in terms of the number of countries that are affected. The last thing that I wanted to just do, try to do in setting a global context for this is that as epidemiologists, we often look to measures of the sort of intensity and momentum of different epidemics. And one way of doing that is to look at the case doubling time for different countries. And this gives you a sense of what their experience is. And so this is a snapshot taken from a website this morning. I'm just illustrating that there are a number of countries in the world where their case confirmed case totals are doubling in as short as one or two days. Uh, Canada's current uh, doubling rate is at four days. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's a little bit better, but again, illustrates that um, around the world, we are taking um, unprecedented action in order to try to uh, uh, impose social distancing and reduce the number of contacts that any one person might uh, come into contact with. So just before I turn things over to Dr. Sividino, um, a couple of caveats. Uh, this is a review of IPAC guidance, uh, recognizing um, that for anyone who's working in an institutional setting, you need to understand your own institution's policies. What will be offered today is the general guidance that can be offered at a provincial or in some cases national level, but often that has to be tailored in the context of specific factors in a particular institution. Um, we have the privilege of hearing from IPAC experts uh, and uh, an opportunity to get your questions answered, answered, but not all questions necessarily have an answer. And so we, rec we recognize that in a pandemic, the answers may evolve. Our presenters will try to give you the best current information and important web sources of uh, further uh, information. And lastly, uh, our presenters work for Public Health Ontario. Uh, this is a science agency uh, that informs public health actions. They're not able to address questions about the inventory of PPE supplies, their availability, or their distribution across Ontario. And with that, we, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Sividino and ask her to begin the presentation on IPAC practices. Thanks very much, George. Um, can I, am I heard all right? Yes, you are. Okay, so George, you're going to do the slides for me. 
So next slide, please, thank you. And no disclosures from any of the speakers. Very interesting, and as you can see that, um, how George uh, clearly laid out the doubling times. And if we even just look at yesterday, oh, I can hear there's some echo, not sure why. Um, in Ontario, for example, there were 257 cases, and today there are 308, and nationally there were 773, and we're over 900 at 923. So this changes, and you can see that all of the provinces pretty much have been impacted. Next slide, please. So just a breakdown then uh, for Ontario, uh, as I mentioned, the an increased number of cases, we still find that 80% of those are travel related, uh, roughly a quarter from Europe, a quarter from the US. Uh, there have been two deaths and there have been five resolved. As of yesterday, there were 22 patients who were hospitalized and some of those are in serious condition and in ICU. Next slide. And I had been asked to speak about testing. I have a number of slides. I'm going to go through them quickly because I do want to make sure we leave a lot of time for questions at the end. So oh, around 31,000 under investigation. You can see a number of negatives. There was good news that the federal government has indeed acquired a large number of test kits because that had been an issue. Um, very interesting to see how things if we look at China, they had like zero cases in the last couple of days. And so it's now China that we're actually getting some medical supplies from. So getting some N95 respirators, getting some test kits. So it, <clears throat> it starts in one area and really blows up. And it's, of course, really tragic what's happening in Europe right now and even in areas uh, like New York and California. Um, uh, but we are able at this point to continue a supply chain, although PPE, as was mentioned earlier, does continue to be in some short supply. Okay, next slide. So th there may have been some uh, confusion with the case definition. It started off with a person, a person under investigation, that category is being removed, um, as has the presumptive case. So there are now only probable cases and confirmed cases. And so the probable case definition is important because that's what's going to help determine for you when you're going to test somebody. So essentially looking at having either fever of 38 or cough, and that can be either a new onset or exacerbation of a chronic cough, uh, and uh, either travel history or close contact with a confirmed or probable case, or close contact with a person with acute respiratory illness and who has been into an impacted area. And the World Health Organization does have a list of all of those. Um, and then a confirmed case, of course, of around testing. And uh, there are now a number of labs that can test and they no longer have to be confirmed through National Microbiology uh, Laboratory in Winnipeg. Next slide. So this is just, I've got a couple of slides just showing you pictures of what you'll find on the ministry page. So a number of patients will have been directed to the ministry website in terms of looking at taking a self-assessment exam, and that would be their way of ultimately then getting into a designated assessment center for testing. So this is just the first question and what it's uh, basically saying, giving them direction around how to contact telehealth. We know that the volumes are very high and anecdotally that in some cases people were waiting in between six to 12 hours. Uh, it, probably varies by region, uh, but there has been understandably um, a, a real uh, push on call volumes. And you might even notice, as was mentioned earlier in the call, uh, just even regular phone lines and things, hospital call lines, uh, there's just so much volume at the moment. Uh, next slide. So this is the, if you open the self-assessment tool tab, this is the first question you'll see, is trying to differentiate those who are very ill from those who have symptoms and may be positive, but like the majority of people who have COVID-19 actually have relatively mild symptoms, more flu-like symptoms. So if they answer yes to these questions, they're going to be directed then to contact a clinician and possibly be seen in emergency. Uh, next slide. So just a reminder about routes of transmission. You'll recall when this first started, following uh, Justice uh, Campbell's SARS commission for precautionary principle, initially with an unknown virus, we were looking at managing it in airborne, using an airborne infection isolation room with negative pressure, and also using N95 respirators. Uh, that was also a real concern in terms of supply. Fortunately, with the incredibly rapid 
turn around and develop thousands of articles that are in either preprint or peer reviewed articles, it's become very clear that like other coronaviruses, uh, this is really droplet contact uh, transmission. There are some exceptions and that if you are artificially manipulating an airway, such as aerosol generating medical procedures, then in that situation, an N95 respirator is probably still indicated, such as intubation, bronchoscopy, sputum induction, uh, nebulized therapy, which you'll see more commonly in children. Uh, any um, nebulized salbutamol in adults really should be done by meter dosed inhaler. Uh, and it's really just the salbutamol in kids that you would be using that for. And if there is high flow oxygen therapy or BiPAP as other examples. Next slide, please. So again, just a snapshot of what you'll find if you go onto the Public Health Laboratory uh, website and very clearly saying that uh, don't go to eMERGE, just go to the self-assessment tool and you'll be directed from there. Next slide, please. So there are some mandatory data that's required, so it's important that it is completed uh, appropriately. Uh, it used to be you had to contact the lab for testing, you no longer need to do that. Um, also, the regular PCR MVRP testing that would be done multiplex for a number of different viruses, including flu A, flu B, RSV, et cetera, no longer routinely done. If there is a clinical reason for that to be done, then it needs to, they will, such as hospitalized outbreaks or institutionalized, it'll continue. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, not recommending routine testing of asymptomatic cases. This is meant to be following the Minister of Health's case definition, which I'd spoken to earlier. However, if there's a, a reason, one reason could be looking at healthcare workers as essential workers who need to return. They may have a positive travel history. They may be asymptomatic, but you need them at work. So this is something that could be arranged in terms of testing. Uh, next slide, please. I won't go through all the details, but just on the website, then it shows you the type of requisition that you would require for each specimen type, whether it's an upper or lower um, respiratory tract specimen, and the importance of ensuring that you're getting it into the right type of swab, and there's the listing of the collection kits there. Next slide, please. Very important that uh, things are um, also completed appropriately, and recommendations differ between inpatient and outpatient. So if it's an ambulatory specimen, then a single upper respiratory tract specimen uh, is, is satisfactory. NPS is still preferred, although a viral throat swab would be all right, as long as it's collected in universal transport medium. For inpatients, you really need two specimens from two different sites, ideally one from upper respiratory tract and the other from lower respiratory tract. Uh, we don't want to do any sputum induction in this situation. Uh, so if they do have a cough, you can collect, but otherwise no induced sputum. Uh, next slide, please. And there are alternative uh, specimen collection kits. So they've done some limited laboratory uh, referencing for these. So uh, these are kits that you may have in your office for other reasons. Uh, and again, there are all directions on the website in terms of how to do that. Um, all other swab types uh, will, uh, except for cotton tip swabs um, or other uh, liquid transport media, accepting those with gel or solid are probably okay, but they may have a disclaimer with them. Next slide, please. So important in terms of preparation for transport, it does need to be in a biohazard bag. It does not need to be double bagged. It needs to be sealed and labeled. Storage is important between two to eight, which is our usual fridge temp and uh, packed on ice. If it's going to be a longer delay, then it needs to be frozen and shipped on dry ice. And then you follow your usual shipping that you would do for your clinical specimens. Uh, and the current Public Health Ontario laboratory testing locations are Toronto, Hamilton, Kingston, and Ottawa. Uh, next slide, please. Around time is it was initially pretty darn good. It's getting a little more difficult with volumes. So they were saying about four days. Anecdotally, it's probably close to five or six. Um, there is also an opportunity for stat samples, but if you want them tested that quickly, then important to make sure that they're sent separately and not batched together. Uh, next slide, please. 
And again, you need to complete everything on the requisition. If you are missing something, it will not be processed. So very important to take the time and make sure that all the blanks are filled, travel history, exposure history, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Just a little bit on designated assessment centers. They are coming in line sort of day by day across the province. I gather Thunder Bay opened theirs a couple of days ago and Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie have sites up. There may be others that I'm not aware of. On a call with David Williams this morning, there was a question about primary care and who can be doing the testing. Uh, certainly initial primary guidance was that if you had the equipment and you had the um, training uh, to do it, that you would be fine to do it. We know it can be done under droplet contact, so you do not need an N95 respirator. A surgical mask is fine, but eye protection also, gloves and long sleeve gown. Um, and his, Dr. Williams' suggestion this morning was perhaps if you were in a smaller community, you may, through your networks, determine if there would be one practice who would want to take that on. Uh, next slide, please. I guess that does it for me. And I, I will just say it's been a privilege to speak to you. I was born in Port Arthur. I, my old alma mater for my Bachelor of Science in Nursing was at Lakehead University. So I feel very connected to the North and I still have a camp, not a cottage. Okay, off, over to you, George. Thank you. And I think we are at this point going to be hearing from Lori. Thank you, George. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. So I'm going to be briefly going through uh, passive and active screening and personal protective equipment for your clinical office setting for COVID-19. Slide. And uh, we are recommending both passive and active screening. So your passive screening, you probably already have in place signage at your uh, main entryway into your clinic and at front reception. Uh, hopefully instructions for the client uh, to self-identify at reception and uh, then be instructed to perform hand hygiene, apply a uh, procedure mask and, and then wait for further instructions. Um, there is some sample signage on the Ministry of Health website for you and we have a resource sheet we'll be providing you after with those links. In terms of active screening, telephone screening is ideal when you're booking your appointments so you can flag those that screen positive based on the uh, case definition that Maureen outlined for us so nicely. Um, again, uh, being um, made aware uh, regularly of the Ministry of Health website and case definitions as they change is important to update your screening protocols and your script. Um, if you do flag someone positive, whether it's at main reception or over the telephone, we know this is uh, reportable uh, if someone is a suspect or a case uh, to your local public health unit and certainly based on um, your client's symptoms and their travel history uh, and your uh, resources in your community, it's going to determine where they will be best uh, tested, especially for screening over the phone. Next slide. So we're going to briefly highlight personal protective equipment, both for your waiting room, admin areas, reception, clinic room, and then uh, just highlight the uh, putting on and taking off of your PPE. Next slide. In your waiting room for your clients, as we mentioned, we would want them to uh, apply a surgical or procedure mask if they can tolerate that. Ideally, you want to be able to move them into a single room and that would be a decision based on clinic setup. If you can't, you want to separate them away from others and if that's not feasible, a uh, two meter distance from other clients in the waiting room until they can be seen. Next slide. Thanks, George. Next slide. Can we move to the next slide? Are we able to move to the next slide or is uh, someone else able to move the slides for us? Thanks, Laurie. We'll, we'll respond to the technical thing right immediately. 
Sure thing. If you can still hear me while we're waiting for this, um, just like Dr. Sibidino mentioned, uh, there's been a change from using airborne precautions for doing nasal pharyngeal swabs and uh, throat swabs to uh, droplet contact precautions. So um, it uh, changes the availability of your staff now to do those in, in your, test, uh, your clinic sites. Sorry, Lori. Um... Uh, internet cut out for um, a while. I am back online and I'm going to be trying to share that presentation again. Okay. Are you seeing the slide? I am. Okay, and I think we were on the slide. All right, so everyone's back on now. So thank you, George. Uh, so in our reception area, if you do have someone who has uh, you are suspecting uh, or it has been confirmed to have COVID-19, you want to make sure they have a spatial distance of at least two meters or separation by a physical barrier uh, and then ensure they have a procedure mask if tolerated. Next slide. For your clinic rooms or an assessment room to do a clinical assessment on those with uh, suspect or confirmed COVID-19, um, healthcare workers will be performing the droplet contact Cautions. That includes your surgical procedure mask, isolation gown, gloves, and eye protection. Next slide. And in the clinic room, we hope that already your client has been uh, asked to perform hand hygiene and be provided a surgical procedure mask if tolerated. Next slide. For your environmental service workers or your clinic staff that will be cleaning after and between consultations with these clients, droplet contact precautions is recommended for those clinic rooms as, as we've outlined here. Next slide. And the order of donning and doffing is listed here. Uh, Public Health Ontario does have um, lanyard cards that you can download uh, for your staff if you need them. Uh, but this is the order for hand hygiene, then putting on your gown, your mask or respirator, your eye protection and gloves. You're going to remove your gloves first, remove gown, perform hand hygiene, eye protection, mask or respirator and hand hygiene again. Next slide. And this is a link to our Public Health Ontario website for routine practices and additional precautions. If you click on the resource section under videos, there are videos for your staff if you want to do some training on uh, how to take on and take off, uh, put on and take off your full personal protective equipment and N95 respirator. Next slide. And I'll hand it over to Vicki. Sorry. Um, so I'm just going to keep going because we really want to make sure that we leave enough time for all of you to ask the questions that you have. And I'm going to just spend a few minutes now talking about environmental cleaning in the clinical office setting. Next slide, please. So uh, Public Health Ontario has published two different guidelines that address the best practices for cleaning of the environment and medical equipment. In the healthcare settings, we have our general document on uh, best practices for all healthcare settings, which was published a couple of years ago in 2018. And prior to that, we also have one targeting uh, clinical office practice. We recognize that, especially the uh, best practices for all healthcare settings, is quite a large document and uh, quite comprehensive. Um, the clinical office practice setting document kind of pairs the information down for you, and you might find it much more practical in an office setting. So I really urge you when you, have, when you have time to take a look at them, but we're gonna go through a few key elements of those um, this 
this next discussion. So a couple things about what we know so far about coronaviruses and the environment. And please keep in mind, and I think Dr. Cividino has mentioned this, the information is evolving rapidly. And so at the bottom of the slide, you will see a link where we have posted synopsis of various research articles that are being published. And I believe there's a new one coming out um, today as well. But so far, we're really seeing that like other coronaviruses, they seem to be viable for days to weeks, maybe even hours on surfaces. There's different studies that are showing that they can pick up the viral RNA, but what exactly that role plays in terms of fomite transmission is not really clear. And so really it's about looking at the research and continuing to look at what, what's being posted on the internet to see what uh, we should be doing about cleaning. But so far it's not really clear what the role of fomites are in indirect transmission. Next slide, please. And so keeping all of that in mind, and as I mentioned, uh, we have these documents available in Ontario. Our approach is really to focus on having a process to ensure adequate cleaning and disinfection following any kind of clinic visit from your patient. And rather than having a lot of separate procedures for different organisms, uh, we're trying to focus on doing one really good job at the times that we need to do it. Um, there are some exceptions, of course, with clostridials or non enveloped viruses that may require different products, different disinfectants or additional cleaning, like C. diff, as I mentioned. But this is a droplet contact spread virus. We know it's relatively easy to kill with our, our disinfectants. So the key principles I really want to urge you to keep in mind are to keep a good routine cleaning and disinfection process in place. Really pay attention to your high touch or frequently sur uh, touch surface areas, including your waiting rooms, and to make sure that you are using the appropriate product, that you're using a hospital grade disinfectant that has a drug identification number or DIN. And uh, next slide, please. So when to clean? Um, in the clinical office document, there is a little table, which you'll see here on the side of the slide. And it talks about key things to clean either between the patients, such as even armrests on chairs, parts of the exam table, certain pieces of medical equipment, toys are really important, um, things that you need to look at cleaning at the end of the day or when visibly soiled. And we're getting into doorknobs and even these high touch surfaces, you may want to increase a little bit more frequently, but uh, different telephones, wall mounted items, you should have a process in place to ensure that at the end of your clinic day, these are thoroughly cleaned and disinfected. And then there's items that should have a fixed cleaning schedule. Things like refrigerators, ice machines, other pieces of equipment that you may have in your uh, office setting. And uh, those should have a, a procedure where they're cleaned on a rotating basis and course, it's visibly soiled. And so I really urge you to take a look at this table in the clinical office document. Next slide, please. Um, just to remind everyone that you need to make sure that your cleaning is being done well. And uh, there should have some sort of observational method at a minimum to assess how well that cleaning is happening in your office. And we know, especially in the north, uh, a lot of places are contracting um, organizations that come in after hours to do cleaning of your clinic or your office. So you just really wanna make sure and have that conversation with your provider that they are able to properly clean your clinic, that they're using the right pro products and that they can meet the standards that you need to be done um, when you're doing your clinic is being cleaned. So that would be a key message there. Next slide. So that was a really quick um, overview of cleaning. <laughs> and like I said, we're happy to take questions at the end. And we just really want to reiterate again that the information that's been presented today, you will get the slides. It can also be accessed on our website. And we keep telling people to go to the website and review it frequently because information is changing quickly. And you really need to keep up to date and uh, access those resources on a regular basis. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just another little picture of uh, the, the guidance that's out for primary care. Um, it was published on February 11th, and you will see that the screening questions, the case definition that are in that document have already changed. So again, going back to checking the websites and making sure you have the right information. Connecting with your local public health unit is really important, especially if you're seeing uh, patients that are maybe looking for advice or have concerns about travel and maybe symptoms, so you do need to connect with your local health unit. 
And of course, if you have questions about managing IPAC uh, issues in your clinic, our IPAC team here in the north is available. You can certainly give us a call or send us an email and our email address is here on the slide for you. Next slide, please. And I think with that, we're gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Passett, for uh, managing questions. Thank you. Um, and let me just uh, check as to whether you're able to hear me. Mm, yes. Okay. And so, uh, James, uh, we probably have received some questions from the uh, via the chat or by email. Are there any that you would wish to uh, share with us? Sure, George. Um, first question: I'm living in a community as a healthcare pr practitioner with no access to the recommended COVID-19 swabs. Can you review again with me what other swabs I could be using? Okay, so Maureen, you covered that particular item. I'm going to try to get it back on screen for us to review, um, but uh, if you'd like to take that as a sure. verbal question first. Yeah, so it's probably in about the middle of the deck there, and it is on the Public Health Ontario Laboratory site. So if you look, uh, it'll give you like a number, like one that you would do for uh, trichomonas, for example. So there's, um, it has a, a whole set with hyperlinks in terms of alternative swaps and uh, ones that you would likely, you may have in your office anyway. Thanks, Maureen, and I'm sorry, I, I found it. It is um, on slide um, 17, I believe it is, um, but um, is that being projected right now? Not at the moment. Okay, let me just try one more time. Yes. So it looks a little small. You probably want to put it in slide mode. Yeah, I'm going to do that. So there's the set of additional um, kits that can be used as a substitute. And uh, I hope that addresses the question from the first question we've received. And again, the, so, the details will be on slide 17 and the deck that you will, uh, you will have access to. So George, a question that kind of follows up with that. So I'm in a community and for whatever reason, I don't have access to any appropriate swabs, which again might happen in a very small community in Northern Ontario. Do I use the symptoms then of the patient to, divide, to define a presumptive case? Maureen? Uh, yes, I, I, unfortunately that's kind of what you're stuck with. So if you go with the case definition then, um, so if they have those symptoms, if they have a travel history, then that's going to direct you in terms of what that individual should do with regard to self-isolation. Uh, and if you have a real concern, obviously, about their um, condition, then depending on what, uh, whether you've got a local hospital or whether they go elsewhere, then they would, if you are sending them to a hospital, then it would be important to make sure that the receiving hospital or healthcare facility uh, would know about this patient coming. I would only add on to that, that um, this is another area where consultation with your local public health department would also be helpful um, because they will, they may have some specific guidance about alternative testing uh, strategies that may be relevant on a local basis, uh, or they may have information that would guide your diagnostic assessment as to whether there is or is not community transmission being experienced in, in your setting. So there are other aspects that you may be willing, may be able to explore that will um, uh, enable, uh, you know, an appropriate management of that patient. Another question very much related. Tell us what is, what is, how sensitive are the COVID-19 swabs? I mean, nothing is 100%. So how sensitive are you? How likely uh, are we to catch everyone and how likely are we are we to miss a few using the COVID-19 swabs? Incredibly sensitive and incredibly specific. So kind of like 99, 98. Thanks so much. Another that's, quick snapper. No, that's Where great, thank you. No, no, please go ahead, James. Another quick snapper. I work in labor and delivery. Uh, we use Antinox oftentimes for laboring patients. Does this meet the criteria for aerosizing? Yeah, it doesn't meet the criteria for aerosol generating. You're fine and safe to go ahead with it. 
And so that means as a practitioner, I don't need to be again looking at um, that extra uh, protective equipment. Is that what you're saying, Maureen? That's right. So you'd be following whatever your routine practices would be and what you would be wearing in that setting. Great. Uh, another question. Um, I've got a busy clinic. Um, yes, I'm trying to limit who comes through the door. Um, are we suggesting that every patient who comes through the door into my waiting room should be wearing a mask, or are we suggesting that every patient that comes through the door should be doing social distancing in my waiting room? Yes, so kind of a two-part question. You do want to try to do the social distancing. It goes back to Lori's uh, sort of suggestions around screening. As much as possible, it's very hard to change practice. I know that. But if they've got scheduled appointments, you want to minimize the number of people in the waiting room. You want to have the social distancing. You can have cues there. You could sort of mark where people could be. Um, the As to the mask, then there will be the passive screening as well as you should be actively asking around symptoms. If they have a cough, then they should be wearing a mask. The corollary, um, Maureen, is that uh, not every patient would be needing to be masked. It's only those who are exhibiting symptoms or who have uh, appropriate risk factors based on those that uh, the case definition guides us to think about. Right, and, and primarily the, the purpose for the mask in that, in that setting is for source control. Thank you. I'm a healthcare practitioner. I was away on holidays. I have just returned from the U.S. today. Is it better to be tested and be able to return to work, or should I spend 14 days in isolation uh, before I return to work? And it, that comes down to a little bit, and I think that, uh, Dr. Williams, there's a second directive that I think has come out today that we have not had a chance to fully review, but looking at who is considered to be an essential worker as far as that goes. So if you are, um, say, for example, delivering babies and uh, you, you need to be there, there isn't somebody else who can do it in your place, uh, then, uh, then yes, that would be an example of where you would be looking to test and uh, at the very least be able to self-monitor. So you could self-monitor for symptoms. Um, if there's the staffing to allow that uh, either as from a family practice perspective that you go offline and do virtual care, um, uh, then it's, it's better that you actually go into that self-isolation. We know particularly in the U.S. that they have not been doing testing. Um, they have done fewer tests than we've done in Canada. You know the difference in terms of population and that there's been tremendous community transmission in many, many areas, uh, California and New York in particular, uh, Washington State, but many other areas as well. So uh, US, uh, which would have maybe two weeks ago been considered to be a relatively safe place for a travel history, is now coming up to it, not quite to where Italy and Spain uh, and Iran are, for example, but is uh, not far off. So ideally, uh, self-isolation. The other recommendation, if there were any children traveling with you, that they would also need to be self-isolated for 14 days. And if I'm going to swab myself because our community needs people back, we're running short. Um, after my trans-border flight from the United States, if I was going to be swabbing, do I swab immediately, even though I'm asymptomatic, uh, or do I wait a few days if I'm asymptomatic, i.e., you know, what's we're, th we're thinking right. about incubation now. So uh, incubation median time is about uh, three to five days. Um, so, I, I mean, you could, you could choose to swab at any point. Remember, unfortunately, though, that you do the test, it doesn't give you the information right away. So it's trying to find that sweet spot because you'll have a few days before you likely get, depending on where you are. I mean, some places you may get it back a little more quickly. Uh, but as an asymptomatic uh, test, it's probably not going to be a number one priority. It certainly wouldn't be a stat test. Um, if there's the ability to stay home for a few days, if you actually got through to the seven days, we do know that very um, few people after day eight actually um, become infected. So we do have that 14-day window, but most of them will present symptoms if they're going to by day eight. Thanks, Maureen. Um... So just a quick reminder to everyone, the slide set, set will go up on our rounds presentation website. So look for it. Uh, we'll get that up as soon as possible this afternoon, and that's where you'll find it. With the limitation on face shield and eye protection, we're going to run out of equipment. 
can you advise whether face shields and eye protection can be cleaned between patients or whether we are, are, should be disposing of them immediately if we have a shortage? Sure. So actually, eye goggle type should absolutely be able to be cleaned in between. So that would be one that you could reuse and reuse as long as you're following the proper uh, cleaning recommendations. Face shields at the moment are con uh, considered to be disposable. Um, but uh, that's one of the things that I think Dr. Williams might have been getting at. If, we, if you were looking at if you had a number of people that were going to be tested, uh, say that you had a clinic in your community, you say, you know what, we're going to do this morning or this afternoon or whatever, we're going to test 25 people then you could wear that same face shield if you put all of your gear on. And if the only thing that you're doing with that person, then you would just really need to be changing out gloves primarily. And remind us again, how do we clean our eye protection equipment if we wanna be reusing it between, you know, reusing it from one patient to another? Right, so you would, you should ideally be wearing gloves. Uh, and, but I know of course it's, it's difficult because we're trying so hard to preserve all of our PPE. And then you will have the cleaning wipes that are there. So if, as long as it has a DIN number, so in the same way that um, uh, Vicky was sort of speaking to cleaning surfaces, it would be considered a surface so that you would clean uh, the inside and the outside of that. Uh, but ideally to protect yourself, you would be wearing a pair of gloves when you do that. And then you so perform, we're asking, and ahead, perform Lauren, hand hygiene Lauren. after that. Thanks. We're asking really specific questions. I've just seen a patient. I've had some protective, uh, personal protective equipment on. I'm in the primary care setting. Do I take my equipment off in the room? Do I go outside and take it off? And then finally, how do I dispose of this equipment? Does it go into the regular garbage? Do we need a special garbage? You know, how do we keep uh, that soiled uh, PPE equipment once we are disposing of it? So I think key thing is to remove it exactly in the order that uh, that uh, Vicky had spoken to, or Lori, I guess, on that one, and not try not to disturb things. But it's the key thing: do it slowly, do it carefully, follow exactly as was said on the, the in the in the correct order, because that's how you're going to protect yourself. We know that healthcare workers have gotten into trouble. Certainly, they did in SARS mostly in terms of how they doff their equipment. It's not as important in terms of what order and how you do it when everything's clean, but when you're taking it off, it's so critical in terms of performing hand hygiene in between those steps. So once that's done, it's fine to go into the regular garbage and you would just put it into ideally a garbage that's lined with a, like a bin with a lid, and then you're gonna perform hand hygiene. Can I just Thanks. add one comment there, Maureen? Yes, please. please. Just to address, Ideally, you're you're doing this outside the clinic room, if if you have the space in your clinic, if, and especially if the patient is still in the room, then you want to step out of the room and remove your PPE and perform your hand hygiene. So you might want to look at your clinics and figure out where that kind of space could be. Um, looking at your exam rooms and looking at, you know, if you're finishing the patient, but you know they need to get dressed and and finish up to leave the, your clinic. When you step out, you need to kind of look at where you could stand and remove your PPE in a safe way that you're, you're not bumping into things um, and that other people aren't gonna bump into you, that you have your garbage right there so that you can put the items that are disposable into the garbage. As Maureen mentioned, there is no requirement for special waste. It is just regular waste. And also have a place where if there is anything that you're going to um, disinfect at that moment, a reusable item such as a face shield or goggles or something like that, that you have all of that right there so that you can then wipe them down right at that moment and, and your hand hygiene equipment is right there, some hand sanitizer. So really take a moment to go back to your clinics and figure out where that could take place in your clinic. It's George, Vicki or Lori, I'm, I wondered if you might speak to what, uh, the rationale for why hand hygiene is done twice in the doffing sequence. This is something that we have a lot of learners online as well, and it might be useful to reinforce this particular point because otherwise the intuitive action would be to only do it once at the end. Okay. 
I think Lori and I are both waiting. Who's <laughs> gonna jump on? <laughs> I was talking. Start, and Lori, if you want to jump in, you can add sure thing. extra. So the idea is you're the first thing, so you have to really look at your doffing procedure. So you're gonna remove your most contaminated, likely contaminated items first. You're going to remove your gloves and you can remove your gown. Before you go on to do anything else, especially something like bringing your hands to your face, you want to clean them. So you're going to clean your hands with your hand sanitizer, and then you can begin to remove your eye protection and your mask or N95 respirator. And then once you've completed those steps, you want to perform hand hygiene again, just in case you've touched anything that you're, you can safely walk away knowing your hands are clean. So ideally, it's going from most contaminated to least contaminated, and you wanna make sure you clean your hands in between, especially when you're looking at bringing them to your face. So I'm not sure, Lori or Maureen, if there's anything else you wanna add. That was perfect. Yeah, that was good, Vicki. Just, just know that the hand hygiene technique, we do have good videos for that. It is a usually 15 second rub. So you wanna make sure that that uh, hand product has dried adequately when you're uh, applying your PPE so uh, you can get those gloves on appropriately. So maybe I will just make a comment about hand hygiene. Something that we really sort of take for granted, we don't necessarily do it well. For each of us, if you think, when the last time I washed my hands, how did I do it? You probably spent about six or seven seconds. You really need to do that 15 seconds or you're not gonna have enough friction if you're using soap and water because that's what you're counting on. So when you're using liquid soap and you should never use a bar of soap, that's just for your shower. If you have even in your uh, a shared bathroom in your home, you should have liquid soap in it. So then you're using the lubrication of, of the soap and the water if you're washing your hands. So the 15 seconds, in between your fingers, base of thumb is often an area that's missed, uh, sort of in around the nails uh, and, and fronts and backs. So your hand actually goes up to your wrist, don't forget that. So really, really important. That's a key thing in terms of trying to reduce those microorganisms. We know that it's droplet contact, so they are going to get onto your hands that way. That we also know that either alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water are effective. They both need to be done for a minimum of 15 seconds. Uh, alcohol-based alcohol hand sanitizer are a little bit harder to find. So soap and water still is effective, so to remember that. And also, if you, you are using ABHR, it needs to be at least 60 to 90% of either ethanol or isopropyl alcohol to be effective. So I'm washing my hands. Does the temperature of the water make any difference for the hand hand washing that we're all doing? Not particularly. They say typically tepid. People often want to make it very hot, but you're not going to be sterilizing your hands. So it's really more the running water and the friction and the duration of time. Um, Maureen, going back to the question that you answered before, because we have a couple of people are still really wondering about this. Um, when using ant Antinox for laboring patients, um, uh, what we are finding is that those rooms do have scavengers in them already. Uh, is that in any way challenging the advice that you're giving us that Antinox does not, uh, not be classed as an aerosizer? Or is this a question that is not 100% clear at this point? Back to you. Uh, it was a question that came through Public Health Ontario. What I can do is try to find the more definitive scientific answer about that. And, and perhaps if there's a, an email or some way you could connect me, I may be able to get back to that. But that was a point of discussion over the last 48 hours and was determined to be a, a safe procedure, not aerosol generating. So I think what we can do, uh, we, are, we are organizing these COVID rounds on, on the fly. Um, we will identify some of these questions uh, that might need a little bit more clarification, and we will look at a way of having these questions posted with answers as well, knowing that that is uh, consistent with what our knowledge is today on March the 20th. Um, one more question. Does it matter with washing your hands? And again, these may seem like very granular, but they're really important still. Does it matter what kind of hand soap you use for washing your hands, liquid soap versus bar soap? Um, I mean, does that make any difference? Uh, sure. As to, please. So bar soap, I would really recommend strongly because it can be so easily contaminated, should just be your own personal soap. 
So that's what bar soap should be. Liquid soap, if you're looking at it in the home setting, if you wanted to have some perfume in it or whatever is fine. But if you're looking at it in a work setting, it should be plain soap because some people do have allergies to fragrances. The other thing I will say is antibacterial soap is not recommended. It's not to say that it, it won't be effective, but often things with triclosan, for example, will cause a lot of drying to the skin. So one of the things you really want to do is not only clean your hands, uh, but preserve it because you're, the skin on your hands is really your best barrier for protection. So you want to make sure that you've got um, that your hands are moist. So you're using emollients. So you're all the other thing that you should have pretty much at point of care then is also a pump where people can also moisturize their hands. Thanks so much, Maureen. So our commitment uh, to all of our audience is that COVID-19 uh, rounds will start on time and end on time. So a couple of uh, things, we have captured all your questions on chat. Uh, if they weren't addressed, they'll be sh we'll be sharing them with our team uh, this afternoon and look at providing answers on our website as soon as possible. As mentioned, this presentation has been archived and that um, we will be posting that as quickly as possible and that um, the handout that was mentioned along with some of the uh, up-to-date links, uh, those are on our Gain COVID-19 Rounds website. Look for resources and there's a tab there uh, that goes from there. As mentioned, we want to uh, improve on these rounds and make them more effective for you as a practitioner. Uh, on the COVID-19 Rounds uh, site, there is a post survey. It will take you three minutes please, please complete the survey. If you want a study credit certificate at some point in the future, fill that out and you'll be asked to leave your name and email address. We will keep track of your attendance over the next number of weeks and months uh, and then send you one certificate uh, uh, down the road. We'll be coming back on March 27th, a week from now. 9.30 Eastern Standard Time. And again, this will be our regular time. You can put it in your schedule. You can ask colleagues to join us, uh, et cetera. George will be back to moderate uh, next week's session. And George, could you share with us what we'll be presenting and talking about uh, next Friday at 12.30? So next Friday, uh, we will continue to try to answer some of the questions that have come our way. Uh, it, there'll be a focus on some of the epidemiologic and public health management issues uh, associated with COVID-19. Um, these include um, issues uh, around the case definition, its interpretation, the risk areas, but more importantly, it's the uh, ways that uh, you may need to be thinking about talking to your patients about social, uh, the, the social distancing, the self-monitoring or the self-isolation and what all of those concepts mean and the type of very specific advice uh, that you can be uh, guiding uh, your patients through. Um, so those are the things that we've heard about to date, but I would again uh, encourage you to send in your questions. We will try to tailor uh, the sessions so as to respond to the most pressing questions that you have. Thanks, George. So again, you can include questions as you fill out the survey. You've got a question that you think about over the weekend, go back to the webpage. Uh, and again, there's a, a question button that you can use. And finally, um, uh, Dr. Sarah Newberry has mentioned that they have created a plan to set up an approved assessment center uh, here in Northern Ontario. And Sarah is happy to share with any rural uh, sites this, uh, this protocol to follow to set up a center. Uh, Sarah, if you could forward that to us, we'll have it posted on our resource section of the uh, website and we'll get that up as soon as you get it to us. Thank you uh, to George moderating. Thank you to Maureen, Laurie, and Vicky for presenting. Thank you to our audience. Uh, we had approximately 145 of you join us today. And as I was saying, stay tuned, wash your hands. Thank you for providing care to our patients in Northern Ontario. And finally, please take care of yourself as we all together combat COVID-19 in Northern Ontario. <laughs>